Good morning. Good morning. You ever had to lug one of these around? Yeah, about, uh, I don't know, it's, it's been a handful of years ago. I, I was in some of my um, in-class time for some doctoral studies out in California, and I, I was all ready to go. This, this suitcase is older than my children. It, it's got around quite a bit, and I remember being so proud because I rolled it over to my bathroom scale in our house, and it was right around 40 pounds. Now, some of you, if you haven't traveled much lately, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You see, when these hit 50 pounds or more, they, they charge you extra. You have to like take out a second mortgage to ship your, your luggage with you. And so I was all proud, and I going to California, you know, school, it was wonderful. And the problem was when I was over there, every professor thought that they had to give me a binder full of papers and books. It was terrible. So here I am. Have you ever tried lugging one of these when it's overloaded uh, around an airport? I mean, LAX is long, like getting it in and out of an Uber or the rental car and the bus, the shuttle to get to the airport. And then, you know, the other people that are with you, they, you know those people that you hate that have like a backpack and a carry-on? And they're like, do-do-do-do. And you're like struggling to pull this through the airport. And I go up on, on my way to California. I took it in there, and I'm so proud of myself, and took it up to check it in. And the lady behind the counter, I don't even think she looked at the scale. She said, here you go, just go. I get to LAX, and it was like the Gestapo. I pull it up in there, and it's like, they're looking at the weight, they're looking at my bag, looking at the weight, looking at me. It was like 63 pounds. And the, the lady looks at me, and she said, would you like to remove some items or are you going to pay the fee? I ended up paying the fee. I mean, I, I remember back in the, in the hotel room, I had even taken out the half-eaten bag of almonds. I was so worried about going overweight. And I'll tell you, I blacked out from my mind how much it cost. But I, the, the worst part of it all is when I got back home, and I opened up my emails from my professors that week. And every piece of paper they gave me, they'd emailed me in digital copy. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, traveling light, that's what we're talking about this morning. Um, we're going through this series, Road Trip. And it, it's a metaphor for our spiritual journey. That's what we're using it as. And traveling light's the same thing. It's important because we all have baggage. You don't have to be too old to live in this world before you start having baggage you pull around. And, and if you're like me, and I know several people are, you know, at the beginning, these things are light. You know, they have zippers to expand as you go, as you travel. And when I first go, everything's in there nice and neat, and it's really light, but I'm after I've been there for a while, I'm like sitting on top of it just to zip it shut. Our life is a lot like that. The longer we live in this life, the more baggage we have, the more weight we have to lug around with us, or so we think. Now that weight, what does it look like? Maybe it's those words that you said that really weren't the best, and you know, they're kind of on replay in your mind from time to time. Maybe it was a relationship you had with a good friend, and, and now it's on the rocks. And as you look back, you, you just don't understand, and, and you just keep lugging that around. Your part in the friendship no longer being together, maybe it was something last night or a couple weeks ago or maybe years ago. That thing that when people, maybe in polite church company, start talking about stuff from your past, you know you're not going to bring up. Because it's locked up tight in one of these. See, this morning, we come to a text in Hebrews chapter 12. If you want to flip there, go ahead. 
in your Bibles. We come to a text in Hebrews chapter 12 where God encourages encourages us to get rid of this weight, this baggage, this spiritual luggage that, that we are literally lugging around in our life. It slows us down. It hinders our walk with him. He wants us to be free, to run unencumbered this life we have. He encourages us to do that. And then he not only encourages us, we'll see that he tells us how to do it. Look there in the first couple verses of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so how how can believers, how can you and I navigate this spiritual road trip, this spiritual journey? How can we successfully navigate this, this journey, this road trip of life as we're living out our faith? It's, it's not easy, is it? It's not easy. Well, God gives us some insight because if we're going to talk about traveling light, that's what we're talking about this morning. If we're going to talk about traveling light, then the first thing we probably need to do is to stop overpacking. And I think that's what the author of Hebrews gets at right off the bat. See, we need to stop overpacking because this weight, this baggage we carry around, it hinders us, it slows us down, it holds us back. Look there again at the first verse. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, I would probably throw this if I wouldn't have to go to the chiropractor afterwards for effect. But if this were actually full, it wouldn't be easy to throw. You know what I find interesting is God is telling us to do this. He points us back to chapter 11. See, that's the cloud of witnesses that he's mentioning here. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, if, if you're a good church person, you've done a Bible study on this. This is one of the favorites. Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith, the hall of faith. I have a different name for it. It's the hall of mess ups. Because when you really read it as the author intends us to read, you notice that every single person mentioned, they had a lot of failures in their life. But what is being elevated is their faith in God. And it was that faith that overcame their failure. It was the faith that overcame the baggage You see people like Abraham that every time he got in trouble with with another king or ruler, he would say, here's my wife, you can have her, leave me out of it. Ladies, would that be good if your husband did that? Probably not, I'll answer for you. Probably There might be some some, uh, trouble at home after you got back from that one. But he continued to be faithful in following God along the way in spite of his mess, in spite of even moral failure at times. If you look down through that list, you see people like a prostitute who had come to have faith in the God of Israel. Find a man that was called to lead God's armies and, and, and conquer, and yet he was scared. Nowadays, he would be considered a coward And this is a male-dominated society. He literally went running to a woman for help. And then that woman told him he needed to do it by himself, and he didn't. And a woman got credit for the victory that he was going to receive credit for. 
And yet he is in the hall of faith because in the midst of all of his fear and personal crisis, he still had faith in God and followed through. The context here, it's reflecting a time that the early Christians faced when it would be easy for them to slip back in doing things the way they always used to do them as Hebrews. The book of Hebrews here, the letter to the Hebrews, guess who it was written to? The Hebrews. The Hebrews. These were Jews who had become Christian. And so now they were struggling with their faith. Some wanting to backslide and go back to their old Jewish roots. Some completely giving up the faith altogether. Some importing some of their traditional beliefs into Christianity and causing confusion and problems. And God says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And some of your translations say the weight that hinders. Now, in the context here, that's not specifically just sin. It's everything else. Are there things in your life that can slow you down that's not necessarily sin? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things. Some of the things already mentioned, like traditionalism or materialism or politics. (laughs) Thank you. I mean, Christians, we don't struggle with politics, right? Everything that slows us down or hinders us, hinders our faith, hinders the cause of Christ and God's kingdom to advance forward. We need to cast those off. Don't get tangled up in the wrong things. Throw off everything that hinders And the sin that so easily entangles. Entangles. I shouldn't have to describe what that means. It it means something that ensnares us or traps us or trips us up, right? Have you ever been walking down a path, maybe through a forest preserve or one of the wonderful parks around the community here, and maybe it's more of a wooded trail and, and there's a stick or a vine across the path, and you trip up and start to fall? Have you ever, has that ever happened to you? You got your legs tripped up? That's, that's what sin can do. It can wrap around us. It can hinder us from forward movement and motion and literally ensnare and trap us and keep us at a standstill. Imagine if you're pulling and pulling and pulling all of this weight and it gets so heavy that you can't pull it anymore. That's the imagery here. That's the imagery. And now I know I'm not the only one that that has packed uh, a minivan or a vehicle to go on a trip. Now we, we have kids and we've had small kids. Maybe, maybe you haven't packed it yet, but you were on a trip with family and you start loading up the vehicle and then by the time it's loaded, there's hardly any room for people. Because there's so much baggage. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? You look at the vehicle and the rear end's kind of squatting. I I remember my grandma's old boat of a car and her trunk was completely full. Our minivan just loaded down. Or our lives can be like that too, can't they? We can start carrying around stuff that we were never intended to carry around. And God is encouraging us, God is encouraging us to let go. Jesus already took care of this. He took care of it, so we don't have to keep hanging on to it. We need to stop overpacking and bringing this stuff with us. We need to pack light. That's what God wants for us in our spiritual journey. Stop overpacking. And then he doesn't just leave us there. I mean, how can we navigate our spiritual journey, or this road trip? I mean, we, we need to keep from overpacking, right? That's pretty clear. 
But we also need to stay the course. We need to keep staying the course. We need to persevere. Because sometimes, sometimes in this life, I mean, you wake up, and I'll go back to the metaphor of like a trip and driving. You wake up, and you're on your trip, and every single light is green. Have you ever had one of those days? Isn't it beautiful? It's like a gift from God. Every stoplight is green. There's no traffic. It is just smooth sailing. And then other times, you can't even change lanes because the jerk, I mean the person next to you, won't let you in. And you miss your exit and you're late and you run behind. Life is like that. And God knows we need to continue to persevere in our faith, especially when times are like that. Look there at the end of verse 1 in chapter 12. After we're casting off these weights and these things that entangle and ensnare us, it says, and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. And that word perseverance, it, it implies a steadfastness. It, it implies a patient resolve to continue forward. It implies an endurance, a grit to just keep moving forward, never giving up. Historically, this passage, it reflects that kind of endurance that early Christians faced. This was a time, historically, where Christians were beginning to be persecuted. Christians were, were now being kicked out of all of the temples, the Jewish temples, where they had been allowed to worship freely. They were being kicked out, and not only were they being kicked out, they were being imprisoned and slaughtered, murdered. So, were they under pressure? Yeah. They were under pressure. But they needed to stay the course, to keep persevering. I, I remember a time that, matter of fact, this was one of the suitcases in our old blue minivan. Uh, I think our oldest daughter was around four, four and a half at the time. Our youngest daughter was about 18 months old. Our, our son, Isaiah, he wasn't even a thought yet. And we, we were going on our first really big family vacation my mother and father-in-law had a condo in Panama City Beach, and we were going to drive down there. And now, I, it's been a few years ago. I was somewhat less dumb, that maybe, not, maybe more dumb. I don't know. I decided that I would drive while the children are sleeping, because that's what all parents want to do when you have small children. I mean, that's a given. So... I figured we would give them an early supper, get them all in their jammies, we'd load up the van, and we'd take off. I'd drive through the night. It was you know, a 13-hour drive, something like that. In the morning, around 6 o'clock, Brenda would wake up. She would take over, drive the last couple hours on into Panama City Beach, and, and I, I would take a nice little nap, and I could sleep at the condo once, once we got there. Sounds like a good plan, right? I swear, as soon as we left our driveway, we hit road construction. And it didn't stop until we got there. So automatically, a trip that would have been like 13 and a half, 14 hours added like four extra hours. About five in the morning, finally get to Montgomery, Alabama. And I pull off. And through the night, I was basically from empty van to empty van, pulling over to gas station. And I pull off, fill it up. Brenda starts to drive. She doesn't mind driving. She takes over. I get in the passenger side to snooze the rest of the trip down. It was a brilliant plan. Just brilliant. We're in Birmingham. And there's, the Birmingham, if you're going through Birmingham, there's like 20 lanes on both sides. It's kind of crazy. 
and I'm sound asleep in the passenger seat. And, and I apologize to my military friends because it was like a bomb, an IED going off. I swear our van lifted like six feet off the ground. The front right passenger tire exploded underneath me. And have you ever been really sound asleep when a very loud noise wakes you up? Wow! I mean, instant adrenaline and shock. And as I look, what had happened, a semi had blown tires, and there was the big steel belts and pieces of steel radio all over the road there, and one of them rolled around the front passenger tire in morning rush hour time, where my wife couldn't move at all, and just sliced and tore and blew our front tire. And here I am changing the tire during rush hour in Birmingham, multi-lane road. We're calling, trying to find a local shop open. And long story short, it took six hours with two small children in a tire shop before we were back on the road. Do you think I wanted to keep going to Florida? <laughs> no, your assumption is accurate. But we get back on the road, and we go down a way, and there's a Chick-fil-A. None of us had ever been there before. They were still kind of spreading. Kids had a wonderful time taking pictures with the cow. And we get back on the road, and it's one of my favorite vacations as a family. And life's like that. We can have our plans, but there is twists and turns. We, we have no clue what's coming our way. And in those moments, God hasn't left us. He is right there with us. We need to stay the course. Keep persevering. Keep moving forward. That's what God encourages us to do, especially as we're tempted to start looking at this baggage. The stuff that we drag around with us every single day. But it doesn't just encourage us. He tells us how to get rid of it. He tells us how to get rid of it. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on the road fixed on Jesus. Fixing them on Jesus. Look at what he says there. In verse 2. He's talking about getting rid of this weight and the sin. And thinking about the people that by faith have been saved in the past that just they had a lot of issues in their lives. He says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking to Jesus, focusing on on Jesus, the founder, the pioneer, the perfecter, some translations say. Not only did Jesus begin our faith, he's the one that perfects it in him. We are saved. And I, I really do believe that you are here this morning and people are joining us online for this moment. And listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus Christ, he lived a perfect life. And he died on the cross for your sin and my sin. So we can stop dragging it around with us. And let him have it. We don't need to pack it anymore. He perfected it. He completed it. Every once in a while, my wife gets irritated. Just once in a while. Because I'm driving down the road, and I'll, and I'll say, oh, did, did you know that restaurant's going in here? What happens? <laughs> then every, sometimes there's those rumble strips. Do you ever use those rumble strips while you're not focusing on what you should be focusing on? Yeah. This is a rumble strip moment, okay? 
This is what God is reminding the Hebrew Christians and us. He's reminding us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep them fixed. You've hit the rumble strips. You're out of your lane. Quit looking at that deer that's over on the side. Quit being distracted. Don't get tangled up in your own mess. Focus on Jesus. The problem is we like our baggage, don't we? We just keep coming back to it. About, about three years ago, I went on a mission trip to Hungary. It was a wonderful time. And when, when I was getting ready and prepared, the facilitator of the trip, he talked about the last time he went. And he said, don't be like this person. See, when they were in America, they didn't have any problem with their luggage. It was kind of like my first trip to California. They just kind of tagged it and sent it. But they got to Austria, and it was a different story. Some reason, they had to unload the luggage, and they had to transfer it because they were transferring flights. And they got a call, and she had to go get her luggage. And they looked at her and said, we are not shipping your luggage. You need to remove items. It is too overweight. They didn't even give her the option to pay anymore. And this, this is a story of a story, okay? But this is how it was told to me. He said this elderly lady, that wonderful Christian woman, she unzips her luggage. And all of a sudden, she starts pulling out these giant Sam's Club costco size shampoo conditioner set that's enough shampoo for an entire year. They were there for like 10 days. She pulls them out, and, and she's like, well, he's like, why did you bring that? We can get shampoo there. She ended up throwing it in the trash, getting rid of it. Then she pulls out, and this was the thing that I thought that was the most funny. She pulls out this giant economy size Metamucil fiber. Well, you want to be regular on a trip, right? That's, but it was enough for like the entire U of I football team for a year. And she pitches that. But you know, as much as we laugh, we do the same thing. Because there's stuff and there's baggage that we carry around that I can only imagine Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right home, right, the throne of the right hand of God, the Father, looking at us and just, come on, guys, you don't need to be packing that around anymore. And how do we get rid of it? Keep our eyes on Jesus. Because he already got rid of it for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so very thankful for your love and your grace. We're thankful that Jesus truly is the author of our faith, the perfecter. The one that completes it, Lord. You know we're not perfect. and God, right now... You know that each and every one of us has those things. It's just baggage that we keep pulling around, lugging around every single day. God, we ask that you would take that from us. We offer it up to you. Forgive us where we fall short. And Lord, as your word says, separate it from us as far as the east is from the west. May our confidence truly be in you, Jesus not in anything we could ever do or accomplish, but in you. Because we know you already paid the price for where we've messed up. You've already paid our baggage fee. And now we are free to truly live that abundant life that you have in store for each and every one of us already marked out. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.